This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Chapter 12. On the Watch. It has left off raining down in Lincolnshire at last, and Chesney Wold has taken heart. Mrs. Rouncewell is full of hospitable cares, for Sir Lester and my lady are coming home from Paris. The fashionable intelligence has found it out, and communicates the glad tidings to a benighted England. It has also found out that they will entertain a brilliant and distinguished circle of the elite of the beau monde. The fashionable intelligence is weak in English. But a giant refreshed in French, at the ancient and hospitable family seat in Lincolnshire. For the greater honour of the brilliant and distinguished circle, and of Chesney Wold into the bargain, the broken arch of the bridge in the park is mended, and the water, now retired within its proper limits and again spanned gracefully, makes a figure in the prospect from the house. The clear cold sunshine glances into the brittle woods, and approvingly beholds the sharp wind scattering the leaves and drying the moss. It glides over the park after the moving shadows of the clouds, and chases them, and never catches them, all day. It looks in at the windows, and touches the ancestral portraits with bars and patches of brightness, never contemplated by the painters. Athwart the picture of my lady, over the great chimney-piece, it throws a broad bend sinister of light, that strikes down crookedly into the hearth, and seems to rend it. Through the same cold sunshine, and the same sharp wind, my lady and Sir Lester, in their travelling chariot, my lady's woman and Sir Lester's man, affectionate in the rumble, start for home. With a considerable amount of jingling and whip-cracking, and many plunging demonstrations on the part of two barebacked horses, and two centaurs with glazed hats, jack-boots, and flowing manes and tails, they rattle out of the yard of the Hotel Bristol in the Place Vendôme, and canter between the sun and shadow checkered colonnade of the Rue de Rivoli, and the garden of the ill-fated palace of a headless king and queen off by the Place of Concord, and the Elysian Fields, and the Gate of the Star, out of Paris. Sooth to say, they cannot go away too fast, for even here my Lady Dedlock has been bored to death. Concert, assembly, opera, theatre, drive, nothing is new to my Lady under the worn-out heavens. Only last Sunday, when poor wretches were gay, within the walls, playing with children among the clipped trees and the statues in the palace garden, walking a score abreast in the Elysian fields, made more Elysian by performing dogs and wooden horses, between whiles filtering, a few, through the gloomy cathedral of Our Lady, to say a word or two at the base of a pillar, within flare of a rusty little gridiron full of gusty little tapers, without the walls, encompassing Paris, with dancing, love-making, wine-drinking, tobacco-smoking, tomb-visiting, billiard-card and domino-playing, quack-doctoring, and much murderous refuse, animate and inanimate, only last Sunday, my lady, in the desolation of boredom and the clutch of giant despair, almost hated her own maid for being in spirits. She cannot, therefore, go too fast from Paris. Weariness of soul lies before her as it lies behind. Her aerial has put a girdle of it round the whole earth, and it cannot be unclasped. But the imperfect remedy is always to fly from the last place where it has been experienced. Fling Paris back into the distance, then, exchanging it for endless avenues and cross avenues of wintry trees. And when next beheld, let it be some leagues away, 
with the gate of the star a white speck glittering in the sun, and the city a mere mound in a plain, two dark square towers rising out of it, and light and shadow descending on it aslant, like the angels in Jacob's dream. Sir Lester is generally in a complacent state, and rarely bored. When he has nothing else to do, he can always contemplate his own greatness. It is a considerable advantage to a man to have so inexhaustible a subject. After reading his letters, he leans back in his corner of the carriage, and generally reviews his importance to society. "'You have an unusual amount of correspondence this morning,' says my lady, after a long time. She is fatigued with reading, has almost read a page in twenty miles. "'Nothing in it, though, nothing whatever. I saw one of Mr. Tulkinghorn's long effusions, I think. "'You see everything,' says Sir Lester, with admiration. "'Ah,' sighs my lady sighs my lady. He is the most tiresome of men. He sends. I really beg your pardon. He sends, says Sir Lester, selecting the letter and unfolding it, a me message to you. Or stopping to change horses, as I came to his postscript, drove it out of my memory. I beg you'll excuse me. He says, Sir Lester is so long in taking out his eyeglass and adjusting it that my lady looks a little irritated. He says, in the manner of the right of way, I beg your pardon, that's not the place. He says, yes, here I have it. He says, I beg my respectful compliments to my lady, who I hope has benefited by the change. Will you do me the favor to mention, as it may interest her, that I have something to tell her on her return, in reference to the person who copied the affidavit in the chancery suit, which so powerfully stimulated her curiosity. I have seen him. My lady, leaning forward, looks out of her window. That's the message, observes Sir Lester. I should like to walk a little, says my lady, still, still looking out of her window. Walk? repeats Sir Lester, in a tone of surprise. "'I should like to walk a little,' says my lady, with unmistakable distinctness. "'Please to stop the carriage.' The carriage is stopped. The affectionate man alights from the rumble, opens the door, and lets down the steps, obedient to an impatient motion of my lady's hand. My lady alights so quickly and walks away so quickly that Sir Lester, for all his scrupulous politeness, is unable to assist her and is left behind. A space of a minute or two has elapsed before he comes up with her. She smiles, looks very handsome, takes his arm, lounges with him for a quarter of a mile, is very much bored, and resumes her seat in the carriage. The rattle and clatter continue through the greater part of three days, with more or less of bell jingling and whip cracking, and more or less plunging of centaurs and bare backed horses. Their courtly politeness to each other, at the hotels where they tarry, is the theme of general admiration. Though my lord is a little aged for my lady, says Madame, the hostess of the Golden Ape, and though he might be her amiable father, one can see at a glance that they love each other. One observes my lord, with his white hair, standing, hat in hand, to help my lady to and from the carriage. One observes my lady, how how recognizant of my lord's politeness, with an inclination of her gracious head, and the concession of her so genteel fingers. It is ravishing. The sea has no appreciation of great men, but knocks them about like the small fry. It is habitually hard upon Sir Lester, whose countenance it greenly mottles in the matter manner of sage cheese, and in whose aristocratic system it effects a dismal revolution. It is the radical of nature in him, to him. Nevertheless, 
his dignity gets over it after stopping to refit, and he goes on with my lady for Chesney Wold, lying only one night in London on the way to Lincolnshire. Through the same cold sunlight, colder as the day declines, and through the same sharp wind, sharper as the separate shadows of bare trees gloom together in the woods, and as the ghosts walk, touched at the western corner by a pile of fire in the sky, resigns itself to coming night, they drive into the park. The rooks, swinging in their lof lofty houses in the elm-tree avenue, seem to discuss the question of the occupancy of the carriage as it passes underneath, some agreeing that Sir Lester and my lady are come down, some arguing with malcontents who won't admit it now, all consenting to consider the question disposed of, now all breaking out again in violent debate, incited by one obstinate and drowsy bird, who will persist in putting in a last contradictory croak. Leaving them to swing and caw, the travelling chariot rolls on to the house, where fires gleam warmly through some of the windows, though not through so many as to give an inhabited expression to the darkening mass of front. But the brilliant and distinguished circle will soon do that. Mrs. Rouncewell is in attendance, and receives Sir Lester's customary shake of the hand with a profound curtsy. "'How do you do, Mrs. Rouncewell? I am glad to see you. I hope I have the honour of welcoming you in good health, Sir Lester. In excellent health, Mrs. Rouncewell. My lady is looking charmingly well, says Mrs. Rouncewell, with another curtsy. My lady signifies, with profuse expenditure of words, that she is as wearily well as she can hope to be. But Rosa is in the distance, behind the housekeeper, and my lady, who has not subdued the quickness of her observation, whatever else she may have conquered, asks, "'Who is the girl?' "'A young scholar of mine, my lady, Rosa.' "'Come here, Rosa.' Lady Dedlock beckons her, with even an appearance of interest. "'Why, do you know how pretty you are, child?' she says, touching her shoulder with her two forefingers. Rosa, very much abashed, says, "'No, if you please, my lady,' and glances up and glances down, and don't know where to look, but looks all the prettier. "'How old are you?' Nineteen, my lady.' Nineteen, repeats my lady thoughtfully. "'Take care they don't spoil you by flattery.' "'Yes, my lady.' My lady taps her dimpled cheek with the same delicate gloved fingers, and goes on to the foot of the oak staircase, where Sir Lester pauses for her as her knightly escort, a staring old deadlock in a panel, as large as life and as dull, looks as if he didn't know what to make of it, which was probably his general state of mind in the days of Queen Elizabeth. That evening, in the housekeeper's room, Rosa can do nothing but murmur Lady Dedlock's praises. She is so affable, so graceful, so beautiful, so elegant, has such a sweet voice and such a thrilling touch that Rosa can feel it yet. Mrs. Rouncewell confirms all this, not without personal pride, reserving only the one point of affability. Mrs. Rouncewell is not quite sure as to that. Heaven forbid that she should say a syllable in dispraise of any member of that excellent family, above all of my lady, whom the whole world admires. But if my lady would only be a little more free, not quite so cold and distant, Mrs. Rouncewell thinks she would be more affable. "'Tis almost a pity,' Mrs. Rouncewell adds, only almost because it borders on impiety to suppose that anything could be better than it is in such an express dispensation as the deadlock affairs that my lady has no family if she had had a daughter now a grown young lady to interest her i think she would have had 
the only kind of excellence she wants. Might not that have made her still more proud, grandmother? Says what, who has been home and come back again? He is such a good grandson. More and most, my dear, returns the housekeeper with dignity, are words it's not my place to use, nor so much as to hear, applied to any drawback on my lady. I beg your pardon, grandmother, but she is proud, is she not? If she is, she has reason to be. The Dedlock family have always reason to be. Well, says Watt, it's to be hoped they'll line out of their prayer-books a certain passage for the common people about pride and vain glory. Forgive me, grandmother, only a joke. Sir Lester and Lady Dedlock, my dear, are not fit subjects for joking. Sir Lester is no joke by any means, says Watt, and I humbly ask his pardon. I suppose, grandmother, that even with the family and their guests down here, there is no objection to my prolonging my stay at the Dedlock Arms for a day or two, as any other traveller might. Surely none in the world, child. I am glad of that, says Watt because I have an inexpressible desire to extend my knowledge of this beautiful neighbourhood. He happens to glance at Rosa, who looks down, and is very shy indeed. But, according to the old superstition, it should be Rosa's ears that burn, and not her fresh bright cheeks, for my lady's maid is holding forth about her at this moment with surpassing energy. My lady's maid is a Frenchwoman of two-and-thirty, from somewhere in the southern country about Avignon and Marseille, a large brown-eyed woman with black hair, who would be handsome but for a certain feline mouth and general uncomfortable tightness of face, rendering the jaws too eager and the skull too prominent there is something indefinably keen and wan about her anatomy, and she has a watchful way of looking out of the corners of her eyes without turning her head, which could be pleasantly dispensed with, especially when she is in an ill humour and near knives. Through all the good taste of her dress and little adornments, these objections so express themselves that she seems to go about like a very neat she-wolf, imperfectly tamed, besides being accomplished in all the knowledge appertaining to her post, she is almost an Englishwoman in her acquaintance with the language, consequently she is in no want of words to shower upon Rosa for having attracted my lady's attention and she pours them out with such grim ridicule as she sits at dinner that her companion, the affectionate man, is rather relieved when she arrives at the spoon stage of that performance. Ha, ha, ha! She, Hortense, has been in my lady's service since five years, and always kept at the distance, and this doll, this puppet, caressed absolutely caressed by my lady on the moment of her arriving at the house. Ha, ha, ha! And do you know how pretty you are, child? No, my lady, you are right there. And how old are you, child? And take care they do not spoil you by flattery, child. Oh, how droll! It is the best thing altogether. In short, it is such an admirable thing that Mademoiselle Hortense can't forget it, but at meals for days afterwards, even among her countrywomen and others attached in like capacity to the troop of visitors, relapses into silent enjoyment of the joke, an enjoyment expressed in her own convivial, convivial manner by an additional tightness of face, thin elongation of compressed lips, and sideways look which intense appreciation of humour is frequently reflected in my lady's mirrors when my lady is not among them. All the mirrors in the house are brought into action now, many of them after a long blank. 
They reflect handsome faces, simpering faces, youthful faces, faces of threescore and ten that will not submit to be old. The entire collection of faces that have come to pass a January week or two at Chesney Wold, and which the fashionable intelligence, a mighty hunter before the Lord, hunts with a keen scent from their breaking cover at the court of St. James's to their being run down to death. The place in Lincolnshire is all alive. By day, guns and voices are heard ringing in the woods, horsemen and carriages enliven, enliven the park roads, servants and hangers-on pervade the village and the deadlock arm, arms. Seen by night, from distant openings in the trees, the row of windows in the long drawing-room, where my lady's picture hangs over the great chimney-piece, is like a row of jewels set in a black frame. On Sunday, the chill little church is almost warmed by so much gallant company, and the general flavor of the deadlock dust is quenched in delicate perfumes. The brilliant and distinguished circle comprehends within it no contracted amount of education, sense, courage, honor, beauty, and virtue. Yet there is something a little wrong about it, in despite of its immense advantages. What can it be? Dandyism? There is no King George the Fourth now, more the pity, to set the dandy fashion. There are no clear starched jack towel neckcloths, no short waisted coats, no false calves, no stays. There are no caricatures now of effeminate exquisites so arrayed, swooning in opera boxes with excess of delight, and being revived by other dainty creatures poking long-necked scent-bottles at their noses. There is no beau whom it takes four men at once to shake into his buckskins, or who goes to see all the executions, or is who is so troubled with the self-reproach of having once consumed a pea. But there is dandyism in the brilliant and distinguished circle notwithstanding, dandyism of a more mischievous sort, that has got below the surface and is doing less harmless things than jack-toweling itself and stopping its own digestion, to which no rational person need particularly object. Why, yes, it cannot be disguised. There are, at Chesney Wold, this January week, some ladies and gentlemen of the newest fashion who have set up a dandyism, in religion, for instance, who, in mere lackadaisical want of a an emotion, have agreed upon a little dandy talk about the vulgar wanting faith in things in general, meaning in the things that have been tried and found wanting, as though a low fellow should unaccountably lose faith in a bad shilling after finding it out. Who would make the vulgar very picturesque and, f and faithful by putting back the hands upon the clock of time? and cancelling a few hundred years of history. There are also ladies and gentlemen of another fashion, not so new but very elegant, who have agreed to put a smooth glaze on the world, and to keep down all its realities, for whom everything must be languid and pretty, who have found out the perpetual stoppage, who are to rejoice at nothing and be sorry for nothing, who are not to be disturbed by ideas, on whom even the fine arts, attending in power and walking backward like the Lord Chamberlain, must array themselves in the milliner's and tailor's patterns of past generations, and be particularly careful not to be in earnest, or to receive any impress from the moving age. Then there is my Lord Boodle, of considerable reputation with his party, who has known what office is, and who tells Sir Lester Dedlock with much gravity after dinner that he really does not see to what the present age is tending. A debate is not what a debate used to be. The house is not what the house used to be. Even a cabinet is not what it formerly was. He perceives with astonishment that supposing the present government to be overthrown, the limited choice of the crown in the formation of a new ministry would lie between Lord Coodle and Sir Thomas Doodle, supposing it to be impossible for the 
duke a foodle to act with goodle which may be assumed to be the case in consequence of the breach arising out of that affair with hoodle then given the home department and the leadership of the house of commons to joodle the exchequer to coodle the colonies to loodle and the foreign office to moodle what are you to do with noodle you can't offer him the presidency of the council that is reserved for poodle you can't put him in the woods and forest that is hardly good enough for coodle what follows that the country is shipwrecked lost and gone to pieces as is made manifest to the patriotism of sir lester dedlock because you can't provide for noodle on the other hand the right honourable william buffy m p contends across the table with some one else that the shipwreck of the country about which there is no doubt it is only the manner of it that it is in question is attributable to cuffy if you had done with cuffy what you ought to have done when he first came into parliament and had prevented him from going over to duffy you would have gotten him into alliance with fuffy you would have had with you the weight attaching as a smart debater to guffy you would have brought to bear upon the elections the wealth of huffy you would have got in for three counties juffy cuffy and luffy and you would have strengthened your administration by the official knowledge and the business habits of muffy all this instead of being as you now are dependent on the mere caprice of puffy as to this point and as to some minor topics there are differences of opinion but it is perfectly clear to the brilliant and distinguished circle all round that nobody is in question but boodle and his retinue and buffy and his retinue these are the great actors for whom the stage is reserved a people there are no doubt a, law, a certain large number of supernumeraries who are to be occasionally addressed and relied upon for shouts and choruses as on the theatrical stage but boodle and buffy their followers and families their heirs executors administrators and assigns are the born first actors managers and leaders and no others can appear upon the scene for ever and ever in this too there is perhaps more dandyism at chesney wold than the brilliant and distinguished circle will find good for itself in the long run for it is even with the stillest and politest circles as with the circle the necromancer draws around him very strange appearances may be seen in active motion outside with this difference that being realities and not phantoms there is the greatest danger of their breaking in chesney wold is quite full anyhow so full that a burning sense of injury arises in the breasts of ill-lodged ladies maids and is not to be extinguished only one room is empty it is a turret chamber of the third order of merit plainly but comfortably furnished and having an old-fashioned business air it is mr tulkinghorn's room and is never bestowed on anybody else for he may come at any time he is not come yet it is his quiet habit to walk across the park from the village in fine weather to drop into this room as if he had never been out of it since he was last seen there to request a servant to inform sir lester that he is arrived in case he should be wanted and to appear ten minutes before dinner in the shadow of the library door he sleeps in his turret with a complaining flagstaff over his head and has some leads outside on which any fine morning when he is down here his black figure may be seen walking before breakfast like a larger species of rook every day before dinner my lady looks for him in the dusk of the library but he is not there every day at dinner my lady glances down the table for the vacant place that would be waiting to receive him if he had just arrived but there is no vacant place every night my lady casually asks her maid is mr tulkinghorn come every night the answer is no my lady not yet 
One night, while having her hair undressed, my lady loses herself in deep thought after this reply, until she sees her own brooding face in the opposite glass, and a pair of black eyes curiously observing her. "'Be so good as to attend,' says my lady, then, addressing the reflection of Hortense, "'to your business. You can contemplate your beauty at another time.' "'Pardon, it was your ladyship's beauty.' "'That,' says my lady, "'you needn't contemplate at all.' At length, one afternoon, a little before sunset, when the bright groups of figures, which have for the last hour or two enlivened the ghost's walk, are all dispersed, and only Sir Lester and my lady remain upon the terrace, Mr. Tulkinghorn appears. He comes toward them at his usual methodical pace, which is never quickened, never slackened. He wears his usual expressionless mask, if it be a mask and carries family secrets in every limb of his body and every crease of his dress. Whether his whole soul is devoted to the great, or whether he yields them nothing beyond the service he sells, is his personal secret. He keeps it, as he keeps the secrets of his clients. He is his own client in that matter, and will never betray himself. "'How do you do, Mr. Tulkinghorn?' says Sir Lester, giving him his hand. Mr. Tulkinghorn is quite well. Sir Lester is quite well. My lady is quite well. All highly satisfactory. The lawyer, with his hands behind him, walks at Sir Lester's side along the terrace. My lady walks upon the other side. We expected you before, says Sir Lester. A gracious observation as much as to say, Mr. Tulkinghorn, we remember your existence when you are not here to remind us of it by your presence. We bestow a fragment of our minds upon you, sir, you see. Mr. Tulkinghorn, comprehending it, inclines his head and says he is much obliged. I should have come down sooner, he explains, but that I have been much engaged with those manners in the several suits between yourself and Boythorn. "'A man of very ill-regulated mind,' observes Sir Lester with severity. "'An extremely dangerous person in any community. A man of very low character of mind.' "'He is obstinate,' says Mr. Tulkinghorn. "'It is natural to such a man to be so,' says Sir Lester, looking most profoundly obstinate himself. I am not at all surprised to hear it. The only question is, pursues the lawyer, whether you will give up anything. No, sir, replies Sir Lester, nothing. I give up? I don't mean anything of importance. That, of course, I know you would not abandon. I mean any minor point. Mr. Tulkinghorn, returns Sir Lester, there can be no minor point between myself and Mr. Boythorn. If I go farther and observe that I cannot readily conceive how any right of mine can be a minor point, I speak not so much in reference to myself as an individual as in reference to the family position I have it in charge to maintain. Mr. Tulkinghorn inclines his head again. I have now my instructions, he says. Mr. Boythorn will give us a good deal of trouble. It is the character of such a mind, Mr. Tulkinghorn, Sir Lester interrupts him, to give trouble, an exceedingly ill-conditioned, leveling person, a person who fifty years ago would probably have been tried at the Old Bailey for some demagogue proceeding, and severely punished, if not, adds Sir Lester after a moment's pause, if not hanged, drawn, and quartered. Sir Lester appears to discharge his stately bre breast of a burden in passing this capital sentence, as if it were the next satisfactory thing to having the sentence executed. But night is coming on, says he, and my lady will take cold. My dear, let us go in. As they turn toward the hall door, Lady Dedlock addresses Mr. Tulkinghorn for the first time. 
you sent me a message respecting the person whose writing i happened to inquire about it was like you to remember the circumstance i had quite forgotten it your message reminded me of it again and i can't imagine what association i had with a hand like that but i surely had some you had some mr tulkinghorn repeats oh yes returns my lady carelessly i think i must have had some and did you really take the trouble to find out the writer of that actual thing what is it affidavit yes how very odd they pass into a sombre breakfast-room on the ground floor lighted in the day by two deep windows it is now twilight the fire glows brightly on the panelled wall and palely on the window-glass where through the cold reflection of the blaze the colder landscape shudders in the wind and a grey mist creeps along the only traveller besides the waste of clouds my lady lounges in a great chair in the chimney corner and sir leicester takes another great chair opposite the lawyer stands before the fire with his hand out at arm's length shading his face he looks across his arm at my lady yes he says i inquired about the man and found him and what is very strange i found him not to be any out-of-the-way person i am afraid lady dedlock languidly anticipates i found him dead oh dear me remonstrated sir leicester not so much shocked by the fact as by the fact of the fact being mentioned i was directed to his lodging a miserable poverty-stricken place and i found him dead you will excuse me mr tulkinghorn observed sir leicester i think the less said pray sir leicester let me hear the story out it is my lady speaking it is quite a story for twilight how very shocking dead mr tulkinghorn reasserts it by another inclination of his head whether by his own hand upon my honour cries sir leicester really do let me hear the story says my lady whatever you desire my dear but i must say no you mustn't say go on mr tulkinghorn sir leicester's gallantry concedes the point though he still feels that to bring this sort of squalor among the upper classes is really really i was about to say resumes the lawyer with undisturbed calmness that whether he had died by his own hand or not it was beyond my power to tell you i should amend that phrase however by saying that he had unquestionably died of his own act though whether by his own deliberate intention or by mischance can never certainly be known the coroner's jury found that he took the poison accidentally and what kind of man my lady asks was this deplorable creature very difficult to say returns the lawyer shaking his head he had lived so wretchedly and was so neglected with his gypsy colour and his wild black hair and beard that i should have considered him the commonest of the common the surgeon had a notion that he had once been something better both in appearance and condition what did they call the wretched being they called him what he had called himself but no one knew his name not even any one who had attended on him no one had attended on him he was found dead in fact i found him without any clue to anything more without any there was says the lawyer meditatively an old portmanteau but no there were no papers during the utterance of every word of this short dialogue lady dedlock and mr tulkinghorn without any other alteration in their customary deportment have looked very steadily at one another as was natural perhaps in the discussion of so unusual a subject sir leicester has looked at the fire with the general expression of the deadlock on the staircase the story being told 
he renews his stately protest, saying that as it is quite clear that no association in my lady's mind can possibly be traceable to this poor wretch, unless he was a begging letter-writer, he trusts to hear no more about a subject so far removed from my lady's station. "'Certainly a collection of horrors,' says my lady, gathering up her mantles and furs. "'But they interest one for the moment. Have the kindness, Mr. Tulkinghorn, to open the door for me.' Mr. Tulkinghorn does so with deference, and holds it open while she passes out. She passes close to him, with her usual fatigued manner and insolent grace. They meet again at dinner, again next day, again for many days in succession. Lady Dedlock, Dedlock is always the same exhausted deity, surrounded by worshippers and terribly liable to be bored to death even while presiding at her own shrine. Mr. Tulkinghorn is always the same speechless repository of noble confidence, so oddly out of place, yet so perfectly at home. They appear to take as little note of one another as any two people, enclosed within the same walls, could. But whether each evermore watches and suspects the other, ever more mistrustful of some great reservation, whether each is ever more prepared at all points for the other, and never to be taken unawares, what each would give to know how much the other knows, all this is hidden for the time in their own hearts. End of chapter 12